Hello, good evening. Hope you can all uh, see and hear me uh, out there. I haven't done a Zoom, haven't hosted a Zoom webinar for many years, and they've changed all the buttons around. So this is going to be exciting. Um, hopefully you can all see and hear me, and you're here for tonight's uh, talk. Uh, it is the Small Mammals of the Lost Woods. It's the first webinar uh, from, the, from the Lost Woods project. So welcome to everybody. We've got uh, people still streaming in. So uh, a nice crowd this evening. Thanks for, uh, for joining. Um, but before we start the talk, I'll just say a few words about the Lost Woods Project. Um, there we are. Look. That's me. Uh, so if you don't know me, I'm uh, Michael Blanco. I'm, uh, I work for Action in rural Sussex. I'm part of the Lost Woods team as a community development worker. There's a picture of me there. If you look very closely, you can just about spot me uh, hiding uh, in that tree there. Uh, the Lost Woods Project uh, started last year, and the project is uh, looking at restoring the woodlands of Sussex. Um, bringing, local people, bringing local people together to learn about, explore, and care for the woods across the low weald and downs. And together, we're hoping to reconnect with our ancient woodlands and to revive, restore, and protect them for future generations. Now, the project is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. So any lottery players out there? Uh, I know you're out there somewhere. Uh, any lottery players out there? Thank you for playing the lottery because it's funding this, uh, this great project. And when we say Lost Woods, across, uh, across the... Uh, the landscape of Sussex, the woodlands have been fragmented and broken up and separated. And uh, we're reversing this damage by regenerating lost areas of woodland and creating nature corridors between them. It isn't just about the woodlands though, it's about reconnecting our communities with their local woods. And we're running lots of events and courses and walks and talks and, and webinars like this one that help you to reconnect with your local woodlands and their lovely wildlife. Also, other project is to rediscover some of these fantastic ancient and veteran trees which are out there and our surveyors are already started surveying some of these fantastic uh, trees a great part of our heritage uh, which we can find across the uh, across the lost woods it's a partnership with a few uh, a few charities which uh, i'm sure you know uh, action rural Sussex. that's who i work for uh, the small woods association and the physics wildlife trust and the woodland trust and the project itself is here's the project area. We're sort of sandwiched between the High Weald at the top uh, and the South Downs National Park. And the project starts over there, way over there in Sorrington, and then it ends over there in Lewis. That's the project area there. So that's the Lost Woods area. Hopefully, some of you tonight uh, live in that area as I do. And if you want to find out more about the project, uh, we have a website, Lost Woods. If you Google Lost Woods, uh, you'll find the website lostwoods.org.uk. You can find all about the project, how to take part, how to get involved, and what's coming up in the future. Tonight, we'll be talking about the small mammals of the Lost Woods, and we have a special guest star tonight. Uh, hopefully this works. Laurie, is your camera working now? Oh, look at this. Oh. Hi, drum roll. Oh, there we are. It was. Hi. <laughs> it took me 25 minutes to learn how to turn Laurie's camera on. But uh, uh, so there's welcome Laurie Jackson, who'll be talking tonight. So she's having a bit of a party at our house there. She's got the balloons out I do, uh, to celebrate. Yeah. So um, what we're going to just, I'll give the format to this evening. Laurie's going to talk for about 45 minutes, uh, talking about the small mammals, of course. And uh, any questions for Laurie? Um, hopefully I've set this up properly. We'll soon find out. There should be a QA and a button uh, logo somewhere at the top or the bottom. Uh, if you press, uh, if you type on that, you can uh, type into there. Uh, your questions will pop up for Laurie. And I'm going to write them down on this bit of paper here. I'll write them down, questions for Laurie here. I'll put them down there. At the end of the uh, uh, webinar, I can uh, I can uh, put some of those questions to uh, to her. There's quite a few people tonight, so we won't get through everything, but I'll choose the, the hardest questions. Uh, for Laurie for later on. Awesome. And do I get to identify that small mammal on your bit of paper as well? Oh, yeah, you can try and work out what that was. Uh, <laughs> or we can throw it open to the crowd. Yeah, open to, uh, open to uh, <laughs> office there. And um, also at the end of the talk, there's some upcoming events linked to the uh, uh, tonight's talk. Um, there's there's going to be a small mammal walk, which I'll give you details of later on. Also, we'll be launching our Lost Woods Dormouse Survey 2024. Uh, we're going to try and help our dormice in the Lost Woods area. We need to find out where they are first, of course. If you want to be a volunteer helping us try and find these dormice, stay tuned. I'll give more details at the end of the webinar. You may want to grab a pen and paper, take some notes of uh, various email addresses and uh, bits and pieces. Um, anyway, enough of me yakking. Um, I'm going to 
Well, here we go. I'm going to hopefully hand over to Laurie now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Laurie. It changed the button, right? So I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm waiting for the button. Uh, okay, right, hold on. Right, you start sharing those. Hopefully I'll... Yeah, there we yeah. go. Oh, wow. Oh, it's like oh. almost seamless. Oh, no, look at that. Professional. Professionals at work, Laurie. <laughs> oh, hold, on. hold on, hold on. How do I... Oh, wait a minute. Slideshow. <laughs> okay. That's a bit that I really struggle with. My heart just stopped. There we are. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn my camera off. Uh, Amazing. And, and I'm leaving the capable hands of Laurie Jackson. Uh, any questions? Uh, in fact, if anyone just, anyone just type in the Q&A box, make sure it's working. Just put, yes, it's working or something. That'll probably me a, a short dub on the, on the right thing. Anyway, Laurie, I'll hand over to you and I'll uh, yep. see you in about 45 minutes. Brilliant. Well, I will rest assured that, that yeah, look, there we go. The Q&A. Oh, yeah. I haven't even started talking and there's 12 questions. There we go. Um, well, good evening, everyone. And, and thank you to Michael for inviting me along this evening. Um, so as Michael said, I'm just going to give you a bit of a, an introduction to the small mammals of Sussex, um, which is uh, covers a really lovely array of species. And um, Yes, probably <laughs> the first slide for any viewers is a, of a sensitive disposition. What is the importance of small mammals? Why are we interested in small mammals? Um, unfortunately, as this picture does suggest, they do occupy uh, a fairly sort of um, low level of the food chain. So they are really, really important species um, as prey items for things like lovely barn owl, things like kestrels, lots of other mammals. But they do have lots of other importance as well. So lots of small mammals are out there sort of grazing, they're aerating the soil and moving sort of seeds around. Uh, we'll talk about things like mice caching um, as, I, as I go through. Um, so they do have lots of kind of um, interesting, important roles within the ecosystem, and they can be a sort of good sign of the health of, of a habitat um, in a particular area. So the greater the sort of small mammal species richness within an area, that's gonna tell you quite a lot about what's going on in terms of the diversity of habitats. So what I'm gonna focus on this evening is, as I said, going through some of our small mammal species that we can find in Sussex. So we'll start off having a look at some of the identification features. Um, some of the things that I'll keep coming back to time and time again as I go will be have a look at those ears or look at that muzzle or have a look at the coat colour because these are the kind of key things that we look at. So we look at has it got like a lovely sort of um, long snout like this common shoe at the bottom right there or has it got quite a blunt face like this bank bowl on the left? Has it got large protruding ears, big eyes or are they quite small and obscured? Um, also the coat colour can be a really useful hint. Can vary for some of the species and I'll touch on that as well. Um, and another thing to look at can often be the tail length um, and also if it's a hairy tail or a, or a not hairy tail, a naked tail, some might say. So these are the things that we'll be having a look at in terms of identification of our species. Um, we'll be focusing on two broad groups this evening. So this is just small mammals, really. So I'm going to draw the line um, at uh, things like probably hedgehog. Actually, we're not going to talk about beavers this evening, I'm afraid. Um, but we've got rodents, which we'll be going through first, and then we've got insectivores, so, so two groups. And if we look um, at a sort of national level, so the British and also the Irish Isles, um, this is the, the number of uh, rodent species that we have. So you can see a nice sort of selection of mice, voles, dormice, rats, squirrels, and a beaver that is making a comeback in many places. So we do also have an island species of voles. Um, you're going to have to go up to Orkney to find that. That's um, the common vole, um, but we don't have that one in Sussex. So we're going to actually narrow down to these sort of selection of species here. And rodents are a really diverse and really successful group of mammals. So globally, they make up about 40% of all mammal species. So they are, you know, they are really kind of key part of um, the global um, mammal fauna. Uh, they've got those lovely big sharp incisors, um, all the better to, to gnaw things with. And if you've ever come uh, face to face with a, a mouse or a hamster, you'll know that they've got quite sharp teeth. And then at the back, those lovely sort of um, grinding teeth to sort of uh, 
grind down the seeds and things that they're eating. So we'll be having a look at the mice um, the voles and also um, the dormice. There's actually a bonus dormouse in the talk for you this evening. So suspect number one is a wood mouse. So this is um, a really, a really sort of widespread, one of our commonest small mammal species. Um, it might be a very familiar species to many of you as despite the name, it doesn't limit itself just to the woods. Um, it does even, uh, be so bold as to sometimes come into houses. A few key things about the wood mouse, I mean you can see from this beautiful sort of front shot here, it's got those huge protruding ears um, and it's got a very pointy muzzle which you can't quite see um, so well from this angle and really lovely big eyes. So wood mice are a nocturnal species, they're also on the menu for a lot of other species, um, so these kind of big ears, big eyes are really kind of key parts of their um, anatomy as they're sort of going around their their day-to-day -day life so as I said despite the name they're not just limited to woodland so you can find them in gardens in grasslands in scrubby areas farmland a very widespread species and wood mice are predominantly feeding on various different um, seeds They'll make these wonderful caches of things like acorns for themselves um, to sort of see themselves through the winter months. They will also take invertebrates. Um, they'll, you know, they'll eat sort of various protein sources that they come across. Um, so potentially they'll they'll feed on um, if they found a sort of a, a nest of, of of another mammal's young, they might eat that. Something, you know, lots of different things like that. And as I said, they are a, a very um, numerous species within the UK. One of the things that I really love about wood mice is they actually have been documented showing this kind of navigational behaviour. So wood mice have been recorded actually using waymarks for themselves when they're out foraging. Um, the idea being that if they get disturbed, they will flee for cover, but then they can actually, once they know that the coast is clear, they can come back out find their waymark and know, okay, this is my patch that I was feeding in. And they'll actually move that waymark with them. So they'll use um, a particularly distinctive, in their eyes, um, leaf or stone or something like that, that they will move around, um, which is a really lovely behavior. So another very similar species, and it's a species that not everyone actually has heard of, and um, no shade if you haven't heard of this species, it's not so well known as the wood mouse, but this is the yellow-necked mouse. So it's the same genus, um, it's an apodemus species, um, same genus as a wood mouse. Um, it's got a little bit different ecology and it's got a very different distribution in terms of its what it looks like it is very similar overall so you can see this one the side profile here that very pointy muzzle big ears big eyes again this is a predominantly nocturnal species nice sort of rufousy fur and a long tail but the yellow necked mouse has got a very sort of central and southern distribution and actually we haven't really got a very good explanation for why its distribution is so southern and um, presumably it's something to do with the climate but we're not really sure why um, that's in, in Britain so it is quite widespread in mainland Europe. This species is more tied into woodland um, particularly woodlands where there's um, a sort of good cover of um, old trees, um, lots of sort of food sources. Again, they're very reliant on seeds and nuts. Um, they do spend a lot of time clambering up and um, in the canopy. So they are very good climbers, the wood mice as well. Although actually they're tending to nest underground. So they can have these quite extensive um, networks of tunnels. And you can see the numbers are much lower than for the wood mice. Um, so again, anyone of a sensitive disposition, um, I'm afraid one of these mice is no longer alive, or probably neither of them are any longer alive, because mice are only really going to live for a year and a half if they're lucky. But the main way, if you really want to tell the difference between a wood mouse and a yellow necked mouse, is you're going to have to turn it upside down. And they're not necessarily keen on that, um, but that's the kind of key thing that you, you want to do to have a look for the distinguishing feature. So the mouse on the right hand side, you can see it's got a really well developed collar of broadly yellow. Um, and it kind of goes between the mouse's collarbones and actually extends down the chest. So that is the yellow necked mouse. 
The wood mouse on the left, you can see there's a kind of like smudge of color there, but it's nowhere near as extensive. And that's that's the kind of key feature that you're looking for with these two species. So next time you see an apodemus mouse, if you want to know, and you're in central or southern England, you want to know which species it is, um, you're going to have to turn it upside down. So that's um, our, our two apodema species that we find in Sussex, and they're both, um, you know, reasonably widespread within the county. Uh, well, wood mouse will be very widespread, and, and uh, the yellow-necked mouse certainly within all the kind of uh, woody habitats. There is another mouse species, which is the house mouse. Um, so this is uh, a species that's uh, been introduced into the UK, of course, very widespread globally, um, and it's really kind of um, tied into its sort of success is tied into humans and human habitats so that's where it really tends to do uh, well out in the wild they don't tend to do as well because this mouse is a lot smaller so they're not great at competing with things like the wood mouse um, it's a lot more as you can see a lot more sort of gray and drab looking um, than those kind of lovely russety colored wood mice and yellow necked mice so, as I said, often found in association with people, um, particularly urban areas, farmland, where there's lots of sort of um, grains and seeds, lots of food sources for them, and they can reach huge numbers. Um, so all of these um, population numbers that I've put on the slides, these are all sort of our best estimates, really. And I will kind of come on to talk about um, mammal recording and some of the kind of perhaps the issues with mammal recording um, as we go. So one final mouse for you, um, and well, it's fine to have favourites, I think. This is my favourite. So this is the harvest mouse, um, and you can see there's a little bit of a hint in the scientific name there that this is a very small mouse. Uh, so this is on average four to six grams, um, so that's about the size of a gold crest uh, weight-wise, or about the size of a pipistrelle bat weight-wise. So it's not a, not a big um, rodent at all. It's got this lovely kind of sandy colored fur on top and you can see lots of white underneath and lots of adaptations um, for, for climbing and clambering around in what's called the stalk zone. So these guys tend to live um, out in sort of wetland habitats, so reed beds, and also sort of nice tussocky grassland, particularly where there's lots of kind of um, interface with kind of um, young scrub. So um, they're sort of clambering around in those areas. You can see demonstrated really nicely in this photo that the harvest mouse has got a prehensile tail. So that's like another limb almost um, from a functional point of view. It can cling on to um, twigs and, and stems with this tail and that frees up those front two um, hands for for feeding and again they're taking lots of lots of seeds um, they will eat insects and they'll turn their attentions to those things when there's less other food around they make these beautiful woven nests and I've got a couple of pictures of those uh, later as we go um, so they're basically stripping grass um, to make these lovely sort of balls uh, they're they're very small um, so a breeding nest might be the size of a tennis ball a nest for an individual mouse is smaller, and um, as I said, these aren't big mice at all. Harvest mice, it's really tricky to get um, a sense exactly of what's going on with their populations. They're not the easiest species to survey, and I'll come back to this as we talk through some of the survey techniques. We do know that, unfortunately, a lot of them are going to die off over the winter. Um, in some years, in poor winters, it could be up to the estimates of it could be up to sort of 80 90 percent mortality over the winter but they can bounce back um each female will have a couple of litters in a year um the females are incredibly uh, aggressive with um with their young when it's time for them to leave the nest they're they're very sort of um forceful that they do so um so you can see this species is now considered to be near threatened um in britain so it's a species that is doing less well than the other mice that we've had a look at so far so we're going to have a look at some of our voles um so three vole species that you can find in sussex um so this vole uh, this is this is the kind of uh, very charismatic and uh, sleek looking bank vole um, you can see it's it's got again a very sort of blunt muzzle um, and fairly large ears, but they're sort of partially obscured by the fur there um, and quite big eyes. One of the key things with the voles, um, with 
the bank vol and the field vol that we'll come on to talk about shortly to take note of is the tail length. So you can see in this picture here, this vole has got a tail that's about um, half its body length and it's kind of a bit pale underneath as well. So that's um, a key feature of the bank vole. And bank voles, they like sort of um, reasonably good ground cover. So you will find them in grasslands, but where there's a bit of sort of tussocky structure and hedgy um, and scrubby edges, those kinds of things. Um, voles are very much herbivores um, in general. So they'll be taking lots of um, different sort of leaves and seeds, as you can see. Um, and again, bank voles um, are a very sort of numerous species within um, Britain. So they're mostly active in the day um, and they'll have um, They'll make sort of little nests for themselves um, out of often stripped um, and shredded grass, but it's not woven like the uh, harvest mouse does. So I should have said with the uh, wood mouse um, and the yellow necked mouse, their nests are kind of made out of dried leaves. So a kind of loose collection of dried leaves, sometimes with a little kind of depression where you can see they've kind of been snuggling down for the night. So we had the very sleek and glamorous bank full. Its slightly scruffy counterpart is the field vole. Um, and this picture really is to demonstrate that key difference of the tail. So you can see this has got a much shorter tail length. So sometimes you will hear people refer to this as the short tailed field vole. So that tail length is about a third of the body length. And I also think the coat color is slightly different as well. So it's a little bit sort of um, less of that rufous color, perhaps more of a kind of gray brown. And this is a species, as the name suggests, of a slightly more open habitat, but still they do like a bit of uh, ground cover, particularly sort of rough grasslands, tusky grasslands. Um, and you'll find they're making all sorts of lovely runs underneath um, that sort of good grass cover. So where there's a nice sort of established and developed sward. So again, a herbivorous species. Um, these are a very probably our most common mammal and they're a very key um, food source for, for lots of species. So um, things like foxes, weasels, uh, kestrels. Unfortunately, a lot of them will fall prey to domestic cats as well. Um, but yeah, a really, a really key food source for lots of other things. So just to put the two side by side, so you can see the, the sleek um, and glamorous bank full uh, that's really made a bit of effort with its appearance and then the, the kind of scruffy looking um, field vole on the right there. So uh, the ears are a little bit more obscured within that kind of scruffy coat. So we've got our, um, our smart vole and our scruffy vole, um, and we've now got our super aggressive vole. Um, so the water vole is our third vole species that we can find um, in parts of Sussex. So unfortunately, this species has declined a lot. Um, and it's kind of got three main stronghold areas now within um, Sussex. This is a lot larger um, than the bank vole and the field vole. So it's not something that you're gonna get muddled up with one of those. Um, again, it's got that very sort of volley appearance. So blunt muzzle, fairly sort of obscured, sort of not huge ears like a mouse does. Um, they are very tied into wetland habitats in general in Britain. So you'll be finding them um, usually around wetland sites where there is good cover of lots of lush vegetation, uh, slow flowing water, fairly deep, and also banks that can support um, their sort of network of burrows that they will excavate for themselves. So these are um, as you can see, herbivorous species. So they will have a really wide diet, although they will, um, particularly in the winter months, uh, they'll eat sort of more things like potentially fungi and roots and all sorts of things. And actually, I thinking about how much it's been raining recently, one of the things that can be really key for water voles with their um, strong link to water is actually um, habitat structure so they do often need some kind of scrubby patches that they can um, climb uh, to get away from flood water if needs be. So I said this is a, an aggressive species um, this is particularly driven by the females um, so they are, are very territorial so all of the other species we've looked at so far are kind of they're solitary but they're not 
particularly territorial and they'll kind of tolerate one another but feel uh, so water voles this is not the case so they will maintain a territory for a female it's going to be about 70 meters um of sort of linear habitat along a water course for a male it's going to be about double that and so a male's habitat will overlap with um several females females won't tolerate other voles within their habitat apart from perhaps one or two of their daughters and um, so they may let one or two of their daughters stay within their habitat but all others will be driven out and you will see water voles are often sort of um you know tufts of hair missing sort of chomp marks out of ears and all sorts of things like that um, so unfortunately, as you can see here, this species is now considered endangered within Britain. Um, you know, it has it has declined significantly. And as I said, in Sussex now is only found um, in sort of three core areas. Um, one uh, interesting thing to note before I move on about water voles is that actually this amphibious lifestyle is quite unusual to the water voles that we find in Britain. So generally speaking, in mainland Europe, um, water voles are a lot less tied to aquatic habitats. And there's lots of theories about what um, has caused this. I've read all sorts of things, even theories about perhaps it was competition from rabbits that pushed uh, water voles into these more aquatic habitats. Uh, but it is worth saying that um, there are some, they're called fossorial populations. So there are some populations of water voles up in Scotland. So in Glasgow, um, where they're actually living sort of half a kilometre or so from the nearest watercourses. So they're living much more like the mainland Europe water voles do. Um, so, yeah, quite an interesting thing about this species. I should say as well, in terms of the coat colour, this is the kind of typical coat colour you can see here, but these voles can be incredibly dark as well, almost um, black, some of them. So that coat colour can be variable. So worth mentioning as well, the brown rat. So this is um, another introduced species and again, another sort of very cosmopolitan species globally. It is a species that potentially you could model up with a water vole. It's a touch larger, it's got a longer tail. Um, so the tail's almost as long as the body length, whereas for a water vole, it's about sort of 60% of the body length. Um, again, the rat has got this much more pointy muzzle, large ears, large eyes, but they can overlap quite a lot in terms of habitat. So although we do think of brown rats as, you know, often living around us um, because they're, they're able to take advantage of, of, um, of humans and how we live in urban areas and other areas, um, you will find them alongside watercourses as well. So it is worth kind of popping these two together. Um, again, hopefully you can see in these two slides the real sort of differences there in terms of the, the shape of the face and um, the prominence of the ears in the rat. Another thing to note that if you do see one of these small mammals uh, swimming, if it dives, um, it's almost certainly a water vole because rats don't tend to, you will see rats swimming, but they don't tend to dive, whereas water voles will dive to escape predation. Um, they will also sometimes kick up sediment, the water voles. Um, so the idea is that that's given them a bit of a screen that they can hopefully disappear um, from whatever predator is pursuing them. So moving on to our only native dormouse species. And again, um, and Michael will talk about this a little bit later, uh, we're, we're quite lucky within um, Sussex that we are within one of the dormouse strongholds. So the southeast of England is, is one of the strongholds for this species um, nationally. However, having said that, they are still, um, they do appear to be declining. So it's not, um, it's not all, all happy news for the dormouse. Um, you can see, again, this species has got a lovely blunt muzzle and it's got those beautiful dark eyes and big ears and this long furry tail. So one of the things that's worth mentioning about dormice, often people think that that tail is prehensile, that they can use it to wrap around things like the harvest mouse does, um, but actually it's not. Um, so it doesn't have that sort of utility to the dormouse. It does seem to use it when it's sort of... Um, running and jumping because this is an arboreal species. So it's moving around within scrub and within trees um, in sort of woody habitats and sort of leaping between branches. So they've got lots of adaptations for that lifestyle. You can see those lovely long toes there to really help them sort of grip onto um, 
small twigs and things and they are very very agile i always say to people when i'm leading um dormouse courses please don't be fooled by this picture here of the lovely snoozing dormouse because actually when a dormouse is awake it is very fast um, and it's very agile so the dormouse um, is principally a species of woody habitats so we used to always kind of think that it had to be coppice woodland and it had to be um, ancient woodland. Um, that's not actually strictly true. You can find them in a, a wide range of woody habitats. One of the things that they do really need is good structural diversity. So by that, I mean um, not a woodland that you can look right through, but actually a woodland with lots of understory um, and also a woodland um, or a sort of woody area that comprises a diversity of different species, so um, of, of plant species. So dormice um, have got a very uh, particular digestive system that means they can't digest things like leaves. Actually, what they're really reliant on is um, fruits, nuts, flowers. They'll eat some insects when there's sort of gaps in food availability. Um, so they, they really benefit from where there is a diversity of shrub and tree species. Um, and of all the species that we've um, talked about so far, none of those species have been hibernating. So none of those species um, sort of pass by the winter as I would like to um, by sleeping. They're all awake um, during the winter months, but the dormouse, the hazel dormouse hibernates. So it will basically be building up its fat reserves, particularly in sort of September and October. So really sort of um, eating loads and loads of uh, hazelnuts and all those lovely fruits and things that are around at that time. Um, and then it will, it will take itself off um, to a, a sort of nice undisturbed location, usually uh, low down um, sort of ground level or even below ground level. Um, and it will hibernate until around about this time of year, depending on what's going on weather-wise. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be, if I was a hazel dormouse, I'd be keeping my head down still. Um, as you can see, this species is considered vulnerable um, in the UK. So I actually, I did say earlier, there was a bonus dormouse. Um, so this is our other dormouse species that can be found in Britain, um, and it's called the edible dormouse, um, and perhaps unkindly, it's also known as the fat dormouse. You're not going to get these two species muddled up. So you can see here, your average edible dormouse is going to be about 200 grams. Your average hazel dormouse is going to be about 20 grams, depending on the time of year that you're weighing it. Um, so you're more likely to muddle this species up with a grey squirrel. So this is a species that was introduced um, in, I think it was about 1902, something like that, um, in Tring. And actually it's spread out into the sort of Chilterns um, area. It's, it's considered to be a sort of slow, um, a slowly colonizing non-native invasive species. Um, there is a long-term monitoring program that's been set up for this species. So we've kind of learned quite a lot about how it interacts uh, with habitat and with other species um, that are sharing that habitat. It really does well in the sort of beach woodlands that you find in the sort of um, Chilterns area. The reason why I've popped it in here is actually, um, so the edible dormouse does make itself a little bit unpopular as it, it will go into houses um, and sort of nibble on wires and all those kinds of things. And so people can get licenses to, to trap and humanely um, kill edible dormice. Sometimes um, people do take things into their own hands and edible dormice do seem to be popping up in all sorts of funny places that they probably wouldn't colonize naturally. It suggests that people are perhaps moving them around um, to try and take them as far away as they uh, can from their own loft. So it's probably worth knowing that this species is out there. I'm not aware of any records in Sussex, but um, you never know. Uh, something interesting as well about this species, so it also hibernates. Um, there seems to be some anecdotal evidence that if an edible dormouse um, wakes up at this time of year and it's, uh, it sort of detects that the, um, the tree flowering is, is not great that year, some of them will actually go back into hibernation for the whole of the rest of the year. So they could be spending 
15 months in hibernation, which is, is pretty epic. Um, so another invasive um, non-native species, the grey squirrel. Um, so a very sort of familiar species, no doubt, to all of you. And I don't think you really need to have any ID tips on this one, because I'm sure you've probably all seen one today. Um, it does have some interesting behaviours, which I suppose, you know, it's 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 quite fun to watch them when they're doing their sort of scatter hoarding, which is what they'll do when they're, you see them sort of busy in the autumn, gathering up um, various sort of seeds and things to bury and to see them through the winter. You'll If you watch them, you'll see grey squirrels can be incredibly devious and deceptive because they're kind of wanting to make their own food stores, but also kind of keeping an eye on what everyone else is doing because they might want to steal their food stores, but they also kind of want to like protect the food stores of from other squirrels and you'll see they make all sorts of kind of little fake um you know fake sites where they're not actually burying anything and um yeah they're, they're quite a quite a an interesting species in terms of um the problems with the gray squirrels um and the red squirrels the some of the key things really are this species is bigger, it's better equipped for digesting a lot of the um, seeds and nuts that are being generated in deciduous woodlands that, that we have in this part of the country. Um, so it's it's just much better at, um, at equipped for, for life here than red squirrels. And unfortunately, it also carries something called squirrel pox, which it's less likely to die of um, than a red squirrel. So um, it's it's one of the kind of um, key things as to why they outcompete the reds. Um, I mean, unfortunately, there aren't any reds here anymore, but in this sort of habitat. So we're going to move on to our um, insectivores quickly. So we've got a few shrews to talk about, um, a lovely mole and a hedgehog. Um, so these species are, um, as as the name suggests, they are very dependent on um, invertebrates, not just insects, but that's their kind of key food source. So a very kind of protein driven diet. So they've got very sharp teeth to, to deal with all those exoskeletons. Um, and they are some really ancient um, mammals. So they did evolve really early on in um, the evolution of placental mammals. Um, and there are some interesting um, species amongst the insectivores. Um, and I will say no more until we get to the water shrew, but there's um, something that some, a handful of these insectivores do that no other mammals do. So we will leave that on a dot, dot, dot and come back to it shortly. So the first of our shrew species that we have is this lovely common shrew. Um, the shrews are a little bit tricky, so you're gonna have to bear with me on this one. But if you kind of maybe just squint at the screen a little bit and perhaps turn your head to a bit of an angle, you can hopefully make out that this shrew is tricolored. So it's got a kind of dark color fur on top and then a kind of in-betweeny brown in the middle and then this sort of dirty white um, belly. Um, you can't see the whole tail there, unfortunately, in this picture, but its tail length is uh, less than 75% of its body length. So we'll come back to that when we talk about the pygmy shrew, which is, is very similar. So common shrews share very sort of similar habitat with things like um, bank voles. Um, so they like a bit of habitat structure. Um, they're going to be very widespread and they need to eat very, very frequently. So they do have very high metabolisms. Um, so they're basically sort of roaming around looking for insects. They can eat over 100% um, of their body weight every day. Um, they'll have a kind of active period and then they'll have a rest and then an active period and a rest. So they're not really either nocturnal or diurnal. They're either eating or they're sleeping. Um, they're very territorial and they can be quite aggressive. Um, they'll sort of tolerate each other more in the breeding season, but generally they, they tend to sort of keep to their own devices. Um, so yeah, that's those guys. And then the pygmy tree, which is a very, very similar species. Um, so again, you're gonna have to bear with me on this one. Um, Perhaps you can see in this picture that this shrew doesn't have that middle colour brown, but it just has brown on top. And then you can just see the hint of that kind of um, off white underneath. So this is a, a bicoloured shrew. Its tail is longer 
um, so longer than the commentaries relative to its body length and also thicker and a little bit hairier. And the feature which I've always really disliked, um, but I will mention it because it's always mentioned, is apparently a pygmy shoe has a very domey head. So make of that what you will. Um, it doesn't look that domey to me, but um, this is, is one of the identification features for this species. So again, it's sharing very similar habitats. It's doing a very similar thing. Um, although apparently it doesn't like to eat um, earthworms as much as common shrews do. So who knew? Um, one of the really really interesting things about both common shrew and pygmy shrew um, and probably other shrews as well when we get outside of, of Britain is that um, so again they're not hibernating over winter um, so they have to find a way to adapt to the much lower availability of food and the way that shrews do it um, is that they actually lose it's about 30 percent of their body weight and that comes from actually shrinking down some of their organs including their brain um, and the idea being and some very smart people have tested this to to see if it sort of stacked up and it seemed to that they're actually um because they there's less body mass um they need less energy to support it so it's um it's a really it's a really fascinating thing that they do so because i said they do need to eat very frequently these species um so one more shrew for you which is the lovely water shrew so again a species that we're perhaps um, less familiar with, less well known. So it's a, a larger shrew and um, you can see it's got very dark fur um, and again this sort of um, pale contrast underneath. Um, and it has got a couple of adaptations for uh, the aquatic life that its name hints at. So it's got this lovely fringe of hairs um, on its um, tail that helps its sort of tail to act as a bit of a rudder because they do spend a lot of time in the water. So they're kind of a semi-aquatic um, mammal, if you like. So the diet, when it's been analysed, is about 50% terrestrial invertebrates and 50% aquatic invertebrates. And they will take um, amphibians, small fish, all sorts of things like that, um, because, again, they are um, a predatory species. So um, mostly um, insectivorous or invertebrates. I don't know, that's not a word. Um, but again, um, I said there was something quite interesting about um, about water shrews. So they actually have got venomous saliva. So it's quite unusual for mammals to be venomous. So these guys can actually, um, when they they bite um, an invertebrate um, and sort of get through that thick exoskeleton, um, potentially if it's an insect, uh, they're delivering a, a sort of neurotoxin into um, that insect within their saliva and the thinking is it helps them to incapacitate potentially big and dangerous things like um, water beetles and they can they can basically just sort of tail them until they uh, they get sort of incapacitated by that um, that venom so it's um it's really I think it's really cool um so a couple more insectivores for you and then I just about got time to whiz through a few things before I hand back over to Michael. So again, sorry about the, the dead picture, but it's quite hard to get pictures of moles. So this is an upside down mole and also a, a non-living mole. Um, but these are a fantastic, um, fantastic species. So you can see, I mean, one of the key parts of their anatomy there is those absolutely amazing um, front limbs which are well um, adapted for the life that they lead so they live underground as I'm sure you know excavating these amazing sort of networks um, of tunnels for themselves so those um hands I'll call them are have got really thickened skin um to really sort of help protect them they've got those very thick um claws to help as they dig through the earth um, and also the orientation um, the where their um, humerus bones are attached to their body is quite uh, different to our own which really allows them to kind of almost like a swimming motion as they're um, as they're digging through their tunnels and they also actually I think I find really interesting about moles is that they have a, a sixth digit um, both on their um, front limbs and their hind limbs and it's thought that's um, it's it's to help sort of 
to kind of anchor them as they're as they're sort of um, digging their way through underground. So you can find them in lots of different habitats. Um, they will sort of move around according to how wet or dry the soil is and how much food there is. They're predominantly feeding on earthworms. Um, and basically they're kind of patrolling their network of tunnels, um, waiting for earthworms and, and other um, things like insect larvae to drop in. And they will actually, as you can see, create these living larders. So they will bite um, uh, an earthworm, for example, to incapacitate it, but not kill it. Um, and they will create, again, these sort of caches for themselves of um, incapacitated worms that they can come back to uh, when they're feeling peckish. And then finally, the hedgehog. So again, a species that doesn't really need much um, introduction or description. Um, a really, you know, a really kind of charismatic and, and characteristic species. So all of these spines are adapted hairs. So there's no sort of hairs between them, but these are all um, these are all the sort of modified hairs to make these protective spines. And they've got this really lovely sort of musculature that means they can kind of bristle themselves up or roll themselves up into that characteristic ball if they're feeling threatened. Um, this is a species of kind of open habitats and woody edges, so they will tend to sort of um, move along um, woody habitat edges and they can sort of forage over one or two kilometres every evening and they'll be going after um, lots of different invertebrates, but also as you can see things like eggs and chicks. Um, and again, this is a species that overwinters, so uh, sorry, that hibernates over winter, so we haven't actually had that many mammals that hibernate, just the dormice um, and the hedgehog. So they will make these lovely nests for themselves um, out of sort of leaves and twigs and things. And that's how they'll um, they'll see their, their way through the winter. So um, I've got not masses of time left. So I did have, I'm just gonna give you, you can cast your um, eyes over these and shout at the screen and see if you can work out which species all of these are. Um, and there's another one coming up here to see how much you can remember. And then we're going to just head on quickly to just whiz through a few um, survey techniques for small mammals. Um, so just a few, we're not going to go through legislation because it's not that exciting for this evening. But I suppose um, in terms of conservation, and I think it's something that you know, Michael um, will be probably touching on um, with his plans with regards to dormice. It's it's quite difficult often with um, with small mammals because it, we have got sort of um, a relatively recent review of small mammal populations, but the data for a lot of them is is quite lacking. Um, so it might be that some of these species are declining um, because we haven't, you know, and we haven't got great evidence to know either way so if people are out there and want to be involved with mammal surveys that would be really really amazing and I'm going to talk about um, some of the ways that you can do that just quickly thinking about what are the threats to some of our mammal species um, there are natural predators of course um, and that's all the sort of natural order of things um, so birds of prey larger mammals um, but there are lots of other things out there like the American mink bottom left and also um, domesticated pets that do take more than their fair share of um, small mammals every year so they can be a real problem but of course um, habitat loss habitat change um, has also again really impacted a lot of these species so if you think about things like water voles harvest mice hazel dormice and probably some of the others um, that we assume are widespread and doing fine they're still going to be impacted by fragmentation of habitat so we do have some mammal species that are protected um, red squirrel although as, as said we haven't got that in this part of the country unfortunately um, so for us really it's water vole um, and hazel dormouse those are the kind of key um, protected um, small mammals also bats but we're not talking about those this evening so just quickly thinking about some of the survey and monitoring techniques I'm just going to whiz through a handful of them here um, just to give you an overview of some of the ideas um, for getting involved with um, small mammal surveys so field signs um, there's lots of different field signs and um, 
I suppose one of the things if you are interested in surveying small mammals, it's worth a little bit of research as to which technique is most useful for which species. So I mentioned harvest mice already and the fact that they're quite tricky to survey for. Um, one of the key ways to survey for harvest mice is looking for um, nests. So you can see here these lovely woven nests which um, have been created by harvest mice. So I always say this is a really great survey um, for, you know, for people who are sort of you know, really like a challenge because you're basically looking for grass in grass, um, which is quite fun. Um, a really good time to do this is going to be towards the end of the summer. Um, so that's a really lovely time to go out and look for these nests. And it is really satisfying after sort of, you know, searching around in sort of tussocks or in wetland edge to find one of these lovely little harvest mouse nests. Um, if you don't like looking for grass in grass, but you like to look for maybe tunnels in grass, um, then you could go out and look for field voles. So they make all these lovely runs and things. Um, it's a bit more obvious here on the left where that grassland has been cut. Um, you'll see their sort of nests, um, little shredded grass nests. You can find little latrines, feeding remains and all sorts of things like that. So that's quite a nice survey um, for, for field voles. If you're someone who likes looking at mud rather than grass, um, you could go and have a look for footprints. Um, so that can be a really nice way. And there's lots of ID charts out there to help you um, work out what footprints you're finding. So often around um, the edges of rivers, for example, that can be a, um, or watercourses, that can be a really good place to look for um, footprints of things like water voles. Unfortunately, you might find American mink as well, um, but useful to know where they are. And then moving on from um, footprints, you can actually then deliberately go out um, with footprint tunnels to have a look for things like hedgehogs. So you can just about see in the tunnel there, um, there's some tempting bait, which I think um, this might be tunnels that Michael and I put out with hot dog sausages or something like that. Um, and you can see the hedgehog prints. Um, so the hedgehog will, will come in um, after the bait and it will walk over an inky pad um, and it will leave its telltale um, footprints. Um, so with the oops, with the hedgehog footprint tunnels, um, you would put them out for, for four or five nights. Um, it doesn't have to be consecutively. Uh, you'd use sort of about 10 tunnels um, and that's sort of a good, um, a good sort of presence or likely absence method for hedgehogs. And you use them sort of along a kind of, um, along an edge, like a woody edge, which is where they're likely to be commuting. Um, and the footprint tunnels have also been adapted for dormice, which is really great news. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a dormouse's foot before, but now you have. You can see it's filled with these lovely sort of fleshy foot pads, um, which are really great ad adaptations for climbing. Um, and again, you can um, persuade dormice to, to go into these footprint tunnels and leave their little signature footprints, which you can see on the top right there. Um, another one, and I won't talk about this too much because I think Michael's going to cover it, but a really um, nice survey technique for dormice is looking for nibbled nuts. Um, so if Michael doesn't cover this, we'll come back to it, but that's um, a really useful way to survey for dormice. Um, field vol uh, sorry, water voles have got a whole abundance of signs that they leave behind um, dotted along watercourses. So they leave big piles of feeding remains. There's their runs and lawns that they cut down, but also you can just about see on the left-hand side there, those very sort of tic-tac shaped droppings and they will make latrines for themselves. These are often flattened down because the males will scent mark them and sort of try and pat their scent into the latrine because it's not just um, where they leave their droppings it's a territorial marker so they will be quite regularly dotted um, through their territory and then another another quite fun thing to do um, to look for sort of mammals not so fun for the mammal of course um, is to dissect owl pellets um, so that's an, a nice activity that you can do um, and a, a technique that can be useful for things like um, pygmy shrews um, and water voles is hair tubes. So you can see there's a, a pipe, you need to choose the right sort of diameter according to the species you're targeting. And then you have a little bit of um, 
sticky plastic in there to just catch some of the hairs of that mammal as it passes through. So sometimes you would bait those tubes um, with something tasty to encourage the mammal in. And that's quite a nice sort of passive um, survey technique. You can sort of put lots of tubes out, obviously make sure they're nice and secure and then come back and have a look who's been um, visiting. Feeding stations, um, people are starting to use things like this now. So ho whoops, hopefully you can see the little harvest mouse there coming in um, to investigate the smear of peanut butter, which I suppose it doesn't need, doesn't usually encounter in a, in a reed bed. So that can be quite a nice way, teamed up with a, a camera trap to survey for, for small mammals. Um, and yes, camera traps um, generally can be um, really helpful. So um, certainly if you're putting a little bit of um, grain underneath them, uh, things like mice and voles will um, often sort of hang around and, and eat um, where they find food. Um, obviously be mindful of putting um, food out and encouraging them where they're going to be vulnerable to predation but it's a, a really a really nice um survey technique camera traps um are great for sort of having a look at species richness it's quite tricky to get an idea of uh, abundance so the number of individuals because you don't know if that's 20 voles that have wandered past or if it's the same vole that's um walking around in circles but still useful to see which species are there and then there are things like um, nest tubes and boxes. So these are for species like hazel dormice. Um, there is a little bit of um, a kind of process involved with that in terms of licensing, but again, it's a very useful monitoring technique. And then finally, and I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, but live trapping. So you can use, um, this is a long worth trap, but there are other different types of traps you can use um, to sort of carefully, um, trap uh, and then uh, monitor mammal species within an area. So it can be really useful because you can start to have a look at things like um, breeding success. So this is um, a, a little litter of hazel dormice here. You can have a look at um, the ages of the species, all, um, all sorts of things like that. And you can potentially do things like fur clipping. So you can just see that gray patch there on that dormouse's butt. Um, so that's um, basically a way of temporarily marking it. Um, and actually you can do mark recapture so you can start to get population estimates. So there's all sorts of useful things you can do. And then finally, um, something that's kind of, I suppose, in development at the moment, but there are um, lots of people uh, looking at trying to build up libraries of calls for things like small mammals. So actually in the future, perhaps we can go out with our bat detectors and actually survey for small mammals um, and, you know, start to start to sort of eavesdrop on what they're up to. Um, so my final couple of slides really is just to say I, I is a, a really quick whiz through just to give you an idea that there are lots and lots of different survey techniques out there. So there's loads of different ways to get involved in mammal recording. It doesn't have to be like a, a big sort of formal thing if that's not really what you're into. But what I would say is if you find something like this, a litter of hedgehogs in an Ikea bag in your shed, please do record it because it's super important to know where these species are. Um, even if it's something that feels like it's really common, like a wood mouse, um, all of those records are, are absolute um, absolute gold. So um, they will go, if you're in Sussex, into Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre, and then that's really useful for people like me and Michael when we're working on our conservation projects to go and find out where these species are. So this is a, a mammal map um, for the Sussex and you can find this on the Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre website. So really I think um, any anyone out there who's in, I don't know, Warnham or Wartling, somewhere like that, um, really I think you're going to need to get on it because it doesn't look like there's any mammals there right now and I'm just not buying it. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I'm going to leave it because I've probably gone way, way over. So sorry, Michael, but I will... Um, yeah, I will stop sharing and yeah.